Okay. Oh, that took quite some time to get started. started. Okay. All right. Hey, I hope you all had a good one. A uh, good break. Thanks for joining back. Um, all right. Uh, let's continue with where we left off. Uh, we looked at the first two points of on page 28 that Jesus as the perfect sacrifice. In point one, we see that how, uh, how he is our high priest uh, and our sacrifice, the offering and the offerer. And then we see in second part, in second point, that um, as the royal priesthood, because of the sacrifice of blood of Jesus, we have unlimited access to the Holy of Holies. We've been invited to come, to draw boldly, to come boldly to the throne of grace, right? Um, that invitation is so it's so beautiful that he's it's not just saying come but it's addressing the attitude and the manner that we can come he says come boldly to the throne of grace amen uh, so that was the second point that's where we stopped um so let's look at point three in page 28 we as believers are washed redeemed and made righteous by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Okay, can I read that again? We as believers, okay, that means you and me, each and every one of you in this class. We are washed. We are redeemed. Redeemed. Right? And made righteous. Not by our own deeds, not by just our, not by our good deeds, not by our righteousness for our righteousness is nothing like but filthy rags. But we are made righteous by the blood of the Lord Jesus to have access to enter the holy of holies anytime, all the time, to meet and fellowship with God. However, it is up to us individually draw near to Him in worship. Just like the priests of the tabernacle drew near to the most holy place, we as worshippers and priests in the new covenant have to draw near to him in worship. So the invitation is there, access is there, but it all comes down to us. Will you choose to go deeper? Will you choose to draw near to him? Because the word says, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us, right? So when we draw near individually and worship God, we call it personal worship. Okay. Um, so there are some practical guidelines for personal worship that can help us in our journey of uh, becoming a worshiper. All right, so first point is we draw near to God intentionally. Hebrews 10.22 encourages us to draw near, right? We draw near to God intentionally. That means we, you have to be intentional. It's not going to happen by accident. Okay, you have to make that resolve in your heart. I'm going to seek him until I find him. Right? Okay, so draw, drawing near to God intentionally. And a few points, sub-points uh, in that Point one is we draw near to him with a true heart in sincerity and wholeheartedly. We draw near to him with a true heart with sinc in sincerity and wholeheartedly. And, um, and some time ago, we wrote something, made note of, uh, you know, something that, that that's about coming to him. And uh, I'd like to read it for us, if that's okay says the furnace of intense desire the furnace of intense desire for jesus burns up self it burns up self-interest self-centeredness self-confidence self-glory it means when we come to him we are not here to ask for anything or getting him to do anything we are not there to gain power or favor or for people to know that we were there. We are not there for the sake of our own consistency 
or for our own self-discipline. We are not there to prove our devotion to other people or ourselves. But we are there to simply give him all our hearts up to him because he alone is worthy. To give him all our attention, adoration, devotion, and affection. Amen. Um, so we are there not to gain any power or favor or to prove anything to anybody else, not uh, not to gain, uh, not for our own consistency's sake, right? But we are there simply because he is worthy. And that is drawing near to God with a true heart, in sincerity, wholeheartedly knowing that he is worthy. And so I'm going to draw near to him. It's all about him. He is the audience of one. And I think that's something beautiful that we can learn from Luke chapter 10 when it talks about Mary of Bethany is that she makes the choice to sit at the feet of Jesus and to just adore him, to, you know, just lean into him and, and hear him talk to her. Um, you know, so that invitation is there just to be like that Mary of Bethany for, you know, um, don't get me wrong, we need Marthas as well. Right? We need Marthas who will work who and whatnot. But then there are times when we just need to be still and quiet in our hearts, come before him, sit at the feet of Jesus and hear what he has to say. Okay, So that is drawing near to God intentionally with a true heart, with a heart full of love and sincerity. And then we draw near to him in faith, knowing that he is with us, even though we don't see him or necessarily feel him. We might, there might be times that way, but, but we draw near to him in faith, knowing that he is with us. And his word says, he will never leave you nor forsake you, taking, believing that verse, that promise by faith, right? With a clear conscience, right? Asking God for forgiveness, for repentance, uh, being washed by the water of the word. Okay, so many times in the Bible, the scriptures is referred uh, to water where it cleanses us. Right? And then finally, with boldness, we draw near to God with boldness. Okay, so just five points that we draw near to him with the true heart. We draw near to him in faith with clear conscience. Right, asking for, for forgiveness or forgiving someone that needs to be forgiven. Okay, uh, being washed by the word of God and we approach the throne of grace with boldness, recognizing that we are the righteousness of God through the cross. Okay, so all of that uh, is key for us to draw near to God intentionally. Amen. And then the second point there is express thanksgiving and praise in spoken words or in a song. Remember, guys, we are talking about some practical guidelines for personal worship. Okay, just in case you've lost track, uh, you know, we are talking about some practical guidelines for personal worship. So the second point is expressing thanksgiving and praise. Okay, it has to be verbal, right? Um, you're expressing gratitude, uh, you know. And there's a quote, uh, I, if I may paraphrase it, it says, if you are feeling gratitude towards someone and if you do not say it or express it, it's useless. Right? So if your heart is filled with gratitude and thanksgiving and praise unto God, and if you're not really saying it or you know or expressing it, there's no point in it. Right? So express thanksgiving and praise in spoken words. Right. Um, I'm just reminded by this brilliant quote again. Um it says, um, if we enter his gates with thanksgiving, uh, whose courts are you entering when you complain? If God is enthroned on the praises of his people, then who is being enthroned on the complaints? Right? <laughs> I just thought that's just an awesome quote. Um, so expressing thanksgiving as you enthrone God. And as God is enthroned in our hearts, the, uh, the enemy is dethroned. Everything that is not of God and of his kingdom is being dethroned when we express thanksgiving and praise and express and pour out our gratitude unto the Lord. 
right? And then the third point, which says, worship with the word. Worship with the word. Okay, use scripture passages to express adoration to God. All right. Um, very often, what I would also encourage is to sing the scriptures. Okay, that's exactly. I mean, just just another word for worshiping with the word. Okay, is to sing the scriptures, uh, uh, and that's uh, just a wonderful exercise um, that I've been doing. It, it's been very helpful as well, and we encourage all our worship team members to do that as well. And so, uh, I'd like to play us a video. Uh, where it talks, where it shows, demonstrates, uh, this person demonstrates how singing the scripture can be powerful. Okay, um, so he's going to be singing from Psalm 27. So I'm going to encourage you to just turn in your Bibles to Psalm 27 as we watch this video. And let, and as you watch it, let this, uh, let what they're singing minister to you as well. Okay, so here it is. That's the only verse we're going to sing. We're going to introduce verse one. I'm going to sing through it, and then they're going to sing around it. And this is, this is I think, one of the best ways to study the Bible to get the spirit, to, to, to cultivate the spirit of prophecy. So let's try it. I'll actually introduce it, and then you guys can just sing.
You guys like that? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, man. There is so much to Jesus, isn't it? so much to Jesus from his word and the beauty that his word reveals of who he is is unparalleled um, and so some of the key points that he mentioned in the video is 
uh, uh, what do you say? <laughs> There's so many things. Uh, one of the things he said is he likes poetry, but God's word can do what poetry cannot. And singing words that rhyme is not more important than singing the word of God. Or singing his heart, that's, that's what he says, right? Singing his heart is more important than singing words that just rhyme. And uh, yes, Devia, I'll share the link. Uh, hey, uh, John, if you can uh, get that link, we'll just uh, share it. All right. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. So it's just uh, hey, Thomas. Just look for that on YouTube uh, when you can. Jade Thomas singing the scripture. So. Um, as he was encouraging, uh, you know, and sing, just if you, if you just open up our Bibles and sing the scriptures, sing the scriptures, uh, it, it does something. It did something now, right? And I've, I've, I've seen that video, I've heard that many times, many times, but every time God's word is being sung, uh, it does something, right? And he sang from Psalm 27 and just one verse. They just sang for one verse on the light of God. And he said that they could sing on the light of God all day. And yes, it's truth, isn't it? It's true, isn't it? We could sing of the light of God all day. Um, it's interesting that because in that same Psalm, Psalm 27, verse 4, David goes on to say, One thing I ask of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell or tabernacle or pitch a tent in the house of the Lord. All the, all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Amen. So there seems to be like this progression, right, of David just going past the outer course in the, uh, to the holy place and to the most holy place. And there I will dwell, I will seek, I will gaze, I will behold the beauty of the Lord. Um, and then in that same Psalm, Psalm 27, if if you go down to verse 8, it says, My heart says of you, seek his face, and your face, Lord, I will seek. Amen. Um, so all of this uh, happens when we just, you know, what if, if we can just follow this, one of these guidelines that is singing the word, worshiping with the word, uh, beautiful things happen. Amen. Uh, and the fourth point uh, mentioned is, fourth guideline is, uh, praying and singing in tongues. So the third point was all about singing the word, worshiping with the word. And the fourth point is just taking it up a notch, saying praying and singing in tongues. Amen. So those are some uh, practical guidelines to draw near to God intentionally. Okay. Um, so let's continue looking at Jesus as the perfect sacrifice in point four. It talks about with our identity as priests, each of us have a responsibility to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Okay, uh, we looked at this in the previous chapter as well, and we, where we see that, um, you know, priests never went empty handed before the Lord in the tabernacle or in the temple. Priests never went empty handed before the Lord. Okay, so uh, we now being uh, in the new covenant, being called as the royal priesthood, uh, each of us have a responsibility to offer up spiritual sacrifices, right? And the fifth point there is one of the spiritual sacrifices that we are called to offer as we draw near to him is praise. And how many times have you addressed this in this course? Therefore, by him, let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Giving thanks to his name, right? Um, and so we've emphasized enough uh, on learning about the power of praise, the importance of praise, and and it seems like it can never it can never be enough for us to understand the power of praise, right? It's like a portal that opens up heaven and for God's kingdom to invade our situation, our circumstance. And that's what praise and thanksgiving does. It it's like magnet, it attracts heaven. Heaven cannot listen to our praise and not do anything about it. 
heaven, the kingdom of God has to respond when it hears our praise and our thanksgiving. Amen. It has to respond. It's like one of the laws of physics, right? Like the laws of gravity. What goes up has to come down, isn't it? And so the praise and thanksgiving in the kingdom of God is almost like a law. Okay, if this happens, we have to respond. No ifs and buts about it. If my son or my daughter is offering praise and thanksgiving, I'm going to go. And all of my kingdom is going to come with me. Amen. Um, so that's what happens. And just let's look at a few more examples of what happens when we personally praise him. When we personally praise God. God the King inhabits our praise. His presence, His power, His kingdom, rule and reign invades our circumstances and situations. Praise causes divine deliverance. Do we remember this passage from Second Chronicles? Right. And now when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the peoples of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir. I hope you remember this passage when we learned about the power of praise. Okay, so the first thing what happens is God the King inhabits our praise. He dwells. Okay, that's his address. That is the atmosphere that God dwells in, right? And then that is being released into our situation when we praise him. Well, point three says praise stops the enemy. Praise stops the enemy. And from Psalm 8, verse 2, it says, Out of the mouths of babes, weak babies, infants, nursing infants that cannot defend themselves, out of their mouths he has ordained. It says, Strength. And because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. With our praise, guys, God has silenced our enemies. And praise prepares a heart to receive from God. Praise prepares a heart to receive from God. And Hosea 10, 11 simply says, Judah shall plow. Simply means the praise. Plowing the field is what a farmer that plows the field is preparing to sow the seed and waiting for the rains to come. And so when we praise him, we are preparing the soil of our heart for God to come and reign and bear fruit in us. Amen. So those are the four uh, points, uh, you know, just to remind us once again of what really happens when we praise him personally. Is that God takes a seat on the throne. Praise causes divine deliverance. Praise stops the enemy. And praise prepares our hearts to receive from God. Okay. Um, so are, are, are you all with me so far? Hope everything is good. All is well. Okay. okay awesome. Thank you. Um, so now we are moving into a different section. So until, until this point, we've spoken uh, or learned about personal worship, the importance of it, uh, and, and how there is an invitation to, for us personally to enter the throne room of God, to enter his presence with, with praise and thanksgiving, to enter his throne of grace boldly. So there is an invitation for us, it, and but it comes down to us is if we are going to make the choice to go deeper. Are we going to stay in the outer courts or are we going to go all the way to the holy of holies? It's up to you. Right? And some practical guidelines that goes with it to, to help you, uh, you know, push you and encourage you to go that extra mile. And now we will discuss about corporate or congregational worship. Corporate worship or congregational worship. Okay? Uh, so just before we just look at the notes, there's a couple of things about the congregational worship. Question. Do you think corporate worship is important? If yes, why? Okay. 
do you think corporate worship or congregational worship is important? And John says, yes, okay. Everybody else know? Two is better than one. Yes, why? Why is it better? Okay, two. One is two is better than one, okay. Why is it important? What's the significance of it? To honor Jesus as his people, right? Yes, it helps in encouraging each other. Yeah, encouraging each other. Yeah, corporate worship is important. I think in Hebrews it mentions about the assembling and gathering together, not to neglect the gathering of each other. Yeah. Yes. Also in sharing the word of God. Come on, guys, what else? How many of y'all are part of a church? How many of y'all have missed going to church in the last year and a half, almost two years. How many of y'all have missed the fellowship of being around people in your congregation? Yes. Yeah, thanks Priya. We are the body of Christ. Body has many parts. Each one has its own function together. Yeah, we make the full body, yes. And interestingly enough, yesterday's sermon by Pastor Ashish was about uh, us being one body. for guidance and counseling purposes, yeah, yeah. Awesome, so I think we are all on the same page, uh, at least uh, we don't need to have a debate or something. Oh, yes, Divya, please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to share something that happened today for, for our Sunday service. Uh, so like uh, we were late for the church and we were sitting in a different room. So in that room, we do have screens where they project the worship from the sanctuary. So uh, we were trying to worship, but there were only few people and everyone is, you know, sitting on the couch, relaxing, some looking on the phone, uh, some were drinking coffee and we were like, okay. <laughs> and we couldn't sit there for long. So we and one other elderly person, we came out uh, because in the screen, we could figure out that in the sanctuary, there were many seats. So we just went inside the sanctuary and it was so different. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we were like, oh, how much we missed. Uh, okay. We should have gone in the beginning. So yeah, even in during COVID time, yeah. Yeah, we missed a lot. Yeah, and I should say APC uh, services were one thing that we grabbed hold of during that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lydia. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so many things this COVID has taught us. Uh, <laughs> one, I think, one, definitely one of the things is uh, not to take for granted, uh, just to coming together, uh, you know, of, of worshiping Jesus uh, as one body, isn't it? It's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. Uh, right? So uh, corporate worship or congregational worship. Uh, so we're going to just look at this section very briefly about the importance of it, right? Because uh, a congregational song, in the New Testament was congregational, okay? Uh, we repeatedly, you know, find singing taking place among people who had relationships, uh, you know, shared joy or any corporate purposes, okay? There was singing involved, uh, you know, very often, every time. And um, so this is quote by Ralph, uh, the person called Ralph Martin. Uh, he says that Christian church was born in a song, right? The Christian church, a corporate church, right? Was born in a song. This is a very interesting quote, right? Um, and so, and, and when we look at this notes, uh, we see there are two aspects to it. Oops, sorry. sorry yes. One is the vertical aspect and the horizontal aspect. So we will just quickly take a look at that. Uh, when we come together as one body, as his church, okay, uh, the vertical aspect, what happens there is we are to minister to God. That is one of the main purpose. Again, 
okay, emphasis is to exalt God. That is the main purpose, the main objective, right? to bless and glorify Him, which is our primary purpose in worship, not to get something for ourselves. Okay, we are not the recipient, once again, to, to remind ourselves that we are not the recipient of our own worship, right? but God is. The question is not whether the worship service blessed me, but whether it blessed God. Did you minister to him before you can receive something from him? Yes, we go to church, uh, you know, and that also happens. We get fed. That's also you know, the reason why we go to church. You know, we, we are encouraged and whatnot. But the primary purpose is to minister to God. Okay, we minister to the Lord, not to the ulterior motive of receiving a blessing, but rather with the motive of blessing Him, whether He blesses us or not. Right? We worship to better realize the presence of God. The main difference between a church service and a meeting of a social organization is the presence of God, isn't it? Right? Uh, but Jesus emphasize again he says where two or three are gathered i am in their midst right and we have so many get-togethers and whatnot what is the difference between that a family get together friends get together school reunion college reunion all of that and um and as as believers coming together simple difference is the presence of god his anointing amen it's the same thing that's the same different between the music of the world and the music that is played unto the Lord. C major is the same three notes, C, E, and G, that Hillsong or Bethel, we play. It's the same notes when Metallica, Iron Maiden, all these secular bands play. But what is the difference? Uh, is that the, is the Holy Spirit breathing over those notes, breathing over those chords, breathing over your instrument or what you're singing, what you're declaring, what you are playing, so, right? So the presence and his anointing is, is, is a differentiating factor. To provide the atmosphere for the expression of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, God waits till we are ready to receive his word. To provide the atmosphere for the expression of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And God, God waits till we are ready to receive his word, the prophetic word. Okay. Uh, can you all think of any other uh, you know, examples from the Bible? Uh, how God showed up when people gathered together corporately or congregationally? Any other examples that you can think of? One is from Acts chapter 2. It's, again, it says, when they were all gathered together in one accord, in one heart, right, then the Holy Spirit came. Isn't it? And uh, Many battle strategies in the Old Testament. Yeah, I'm reading your comments in the chat section. And Priya says, in the family get together, the father loves to see his children loving each other and coming in unity. That makes him much happy, yes. Extending this to the heavenly family, that magnitude we can imagine, yeah? Yeah, it's just intense, isn't it? Uh, and again, you know, this theme, it just resonates even in Revelation, which says, every tribe and every tongue, people from every nation will come together. There is, what is happening in Revelation is the worship song being, you know, it's rising corporately, congregationally, right? Um, so another characteristic in the New Testament corporate song is, uh, is the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit itself, right? In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, you know, we know the popular scriptures, 17 and 19. It just clearly uh, says that singing of the early Christians was an overflow of the Spirit at work in their hearts. Right? En encourage one another, sing to one another. That's what it says, isn't it? Um, 
All right, so uh, let's look at the horizontal aspect of it. The horizontal aspect is one is to enhance the sense of unity within a body. Enhance the sense of unity within a body. Okay, Psalm 133, it says, how wonderful and how beautiful it is. Brothers come together in unity. Right? So all believers have this one thing in common, that they love the Lord Jesus Christ and express their mutual faith together in song. Uh, even if you just take the uh, the church factor out of it, right? How many of us have come together? Uh, you know, how many of us have uh, come across relationships or friendships? Uh, you know, and where the common factor was Jesus, right? Uh, uh, there's so many people in my world that I've come across. And the only reason seems to be Jesus. And it is because of Jesus, of what we were doing for Jesus, uh, or because of our love for him, we met, uh, you know, uh, so many friendships and relationships like that, isn't it? Um, so to minister to one another, uh, to teach and reinforce spiritual truth, reemphasizing Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, um, Paul again encouraging, let the word of Christ rich, dwell in you richly. Okay. Uh, point four, to provide believers the opportunity to profess their faith before others and to declare the glories of God before unbelievers. To provide the atmosphere for preaching of the word. Also to prepare the pastoral leadership for the delivery of the word. Okay, uh, it's just so many things that is happening in corporately when we come together. Uh, one, just to re remind us, let's look at the summary uh, in page 31. It says, in congregational worship, one, we minister to God. And corporate worship brings about a sense of unity within the church. The song we sing as a congregation enables us to learn, teach, and reinforce spiritual truth. And corporate worship prepares our hearts and provides the atmosphere for the preaching of the word. And how important is that? Amen. It facilitates us to express the feelings of our heart in uninhibited worship. So that's the summary of the corporate worship and the importance of it. So in conclusion, it simply means God is eager to help us as we prepare but he wants us to ask him for that help. We don't simply plan for meetings, we plan for people. Right? We don't simply plan for meetings or events. Everything that we do is we plan for people and ask God for songs that will serve those you are leading rather than ones you like or the ones that will make you look good. Every person walking in on Sunday morning has unique needs, specific sins he or she is battling, blind spots and a tendency to forget the gospel. We have the awesome privilege of pointing everyone to the greatness, goodness, and the grace of Jesus Christ. We need the Holy Spirit's power to be effective and as we'll never outgrow our need for his help. Okay, so coming together as a church, as one body, um, is more than actually what meets the eye. There's so much more happening spiritually. Amen. Um, so with that, we'll end this session about personal and corporate worship right uh, uh, is there any questions or is there anything that you would like to share or is everybody doing all right all clear okay great uh, once again, I hope that you could take away something of today's class, both the sessions, session one and session two. Uh, God bless you. Go back home and reflect on everything that you learned. Uh, uh, let the practical guidelines help you in your journey in becoming, uh, as, becoming a worshiper as you go deeper and deeper. Amen. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, God bless you all. Uh, have a wonderful day ahead. Stay safe. See you all once again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Priya.